Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Sophia, and I'm one of your Ath Fellows this year. I'm sure a great deal of those in this room have known someone who has suffered from some form of addiction or have seen firsthand the harm it can cause. Whether it be to alcohol, drugs, or even food, addiction is extremely prevalent in our current society and affects the lives of many. It's easy to forget that addiction is indeed a diagnosable, scientifically recognized illness and that there are abnormalities in the brain and body that can cause it. Scientists all around the world are working to uncover and address these abnormalities so that we can begin to find significant cures and improve the lives of all those suffering. Dr. Judy Grizel is one of these researchers uncovering the truths about addiction and working to bring us as much information as possible with regards to the science behind it all. She's an internationally recognized behavioral neuroscientist and a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Bucknell University with an expertise in pharmacology and neuroscience and genetics. Her research, motivated by her lived experiences, focuses on determining root causes of drug addiction and has been instrumental in bringing to light key science behind the issue. She is the author of the New York Times best-selling book and NB book of the month, Never Enough, The Neuroscience and Experience of Addiction which illustrates the neural changes that underlie the development of substance use disorders and make recovery so challenging. She is recognized as a distinguished mentor by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and has been the recipient of numerous grants from the National Institute of Health. As always, I now must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please take this time to silence and put away your mobile devices, adjust your seats, serve up a piece of cake if you haven't already, and now please join me in welcoming Dr. Judy Grizel to the Athenaeum. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here um, to speak with you and to have the lovely dinner and beautiful um, setting. So, and I've enjoyed my conversations. And so I thank you for having me. I'm going to talk about, um, I've been researching addiction, I think, for 40 years or over 40 years. The first 10 or so were on the street and the last 30 mostly in a neuroscience lab when I thought I would solve my problem. Um, I was, uh, so here I was about seven or eight and a nice young girl and here I was pretty loaded at uh, 13 or 14. I, I took my first drink of alcohol when I was 13. It just seemed like a, something fun to try. I drank a half a gallon of wine at least and um, it really changed the trajectory of my whole life. I spent the next 10 years taking as much of every drug as I could find, and uh, as a result of that, I was kicked out of three schools. I ended up homeless. I contracted hepatitis C. I lost the respect of everybody I knew, including myself. So I ended up in treatment, fortunately, which I thought was gonna be like a spa, but it wasn't like a spa, it was like a hospital. And um, I was, it was there that I learned that I was going to probably die if I kept using. And um, I wasn't so sure I wanted to live and it seemed like a really bitter choice between living sober the rest of my life. I had just turned 23 and, um, or dying, you know, in a, some kind of a big mess pretty soon. So I, um, I figured, well, maybe there's a back door. This is one of the many attributes I think that addicts have that are useful in some situations and maybe not in others, but I, I knew there must be a back door somewhere. So I thought to myself, you know, I don't know what this is. I have a disease and I can see that my life isn't going so well, so maybe I'll cure my disease. I'll find the switch in my brain. I, I somehow intuited that it was definitely something wrong with my brain. Um, and I'll, I'll find that switch, I'll turn it, and then I'll be able to use without self-destructing. So against all odds, also using uh, perseverance that served my addiction, it also served my um, academic aspirations. I uh, finished my undergrad, it took seven years. I finished graduate school in another seven, and then I did a three-year postdoc um, to and that was in genetics, to, to try to understand what's different about the brains of people like me from people who don't act like that. And uh, I'm gonna summarize that here. Oh, so I'm not really that, I was gonna say I'm not really that different. I wanted to, I forgot what I was doing here. I, um, I uh, 
I grew up in an upper middle class family, nice, my father uh, flew Air, Pan Am airplanes out of the, you know, Kennedy Airport. My mother was a nurse, it was a nice neighborhood. Um, so I think I, in some ways I'm not typical, but I know now that addiction cuts across all demographics, so uh, all ethnicities, all economic statuses, status, anyway. Um, and all regions of the world, even. So it's a huge uh, problem for many people, and um, in some ways I'm really typical. So here's, here's why me, this is the bottom line, I guess. There's uh, genetic factors and environmental factors and then developmental factors, and some of those uh, genetic factors I certainly had. So people who are really high in novelty seeking, uh, this also serves being a scientist, by the way, um, are, people who were prone to try new things, and also risk-taking, these are both largely heritable. So these tendencies, they're present in third and fourth graders that have an increased risk. Um, reward sensitive, that means that I was, uh, and people like me are, are very interested in feeling good, sort of more interested than is probably healthy, and not so worried about feeling bad. So I, I used to say um, I was grounded about half my teenage years, but when I wasn't grounded, I really made up for it. Um, my, my culture, you know, it was, it, I guess, like much uh, of human culture around the world, we, my family had alcohol around, we had uh, people drank at weddings and funerals and everything in between. So I had lots of access, and my peers were probably typical peers. I grew up in New Jersey, so I don't think it's any worse but in California, but maybe about the same. Stress is a big environmental factor, too, and I'll come back to that later. Um, I, I had a good childhood, I think, so this wasn't a big factor for me, but um, these, these developmental um, perturbations, so either an abuse or neglect or some kind of trauma early on, is uh, very predictive, so people are self-medicating, things like that. But I think for me, probably the single biggest factor was this adolescent exposure. Turns out that about 80 or 90 percent of people who develop a drug use disorder begin before they're 18. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is, and that was certainly my case. But before I do, I wanted to say that um, Using drugs to change the way we feel or think or behave is totally normal. It's, it's not only normal, it's uh, universal. So um, before humans were humans, they were, whatever they were, they were taking uh, compounds to change their feelings. And every human culture that could grow anything, so I guess with the exception of the Inuit, you know, way up in the Arctic Circle, has been uh, taking something. It's not only humans, but all kinds of other animals. Cats have catnip, and um, birds go after fermented berries. Um, there's stories of elephants breaking down distilleries. My favorite story probably comes from a species of ant in South America. In their big ant mound, they have a little section that they devote to raising some beetles. And so they can't, if they're taking care of these beetles, they have to feed them, they have to clean up after them, they can't have quite as many ant babies, so it's, it, there's some cost to this colony, this species of ants. But I guess the beetles grow some interesting fungus on the back of their little hairy beetle legs, and that every once in a while the ants together go and harvest this fungus, and then they eat it, and they get really, really slow for like two days, and then they go back to their <laughs> own ant stuff. So it's just, it's just a, a, a normal drive. This is, you know, I just described insects and birds and mammals and all humans. And part of the reason for that has to do with this um, dopamine reward pathway you may have heard of. It's um, really often called the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. It's a small set of neurons, not very many cells actually. So here's the spinal cord and the medulla and the pons and then right at the top, uh, not many cells that contain, um, that make uh, synthesized dopamine, and these cells project up into the limbic system, so that's why it's called the mesolimbic, because the meso is the midbrain. They project to the limbic system, and when dopamine is squirted out from those cells, it feels really good. 
And it's not good like you're not depressed good or even content. It's good like exciting good, like kind of titillating good, like sexual foreplay or maybe the um, red velvet cake. Uh, you know, something really delicious, good music, good fun. Um, and that pathway evolved through natural selection and it promotes eating and reproduction. So we all have that. Insects and birds have their version of it because if we don't have sex and eat, then it's not good for the species. So we like those things. Every single drug that's addictive and behavior, by the way, that's addictive co-ops that pathway. The reason it's problematic is because it activates that same pathway. And drugs, because we can kind of control the dose and delivery, we can stop at the store and buy as many bottles as we want or you know, as many grams as we want, um, and we can deliver it intravenously if we want. Um, these are really more potent than natural reinforcers. So their, ac their accessibility and their potency to stimulate that pathway are, you know, the cause of this uh, epidemic and addiction that's all over the place. One of the points um, I want to make now, and I'll come back to, um, that's really kind of important, but because they're so potent, they also um, kind of overstimulate it. So in the same way that if you listen to music really loudly over and over again, you have to keep turning up the volume because you're getting deaf, if you keep stepping on this mesolimbic pathway with high potency drugs uh, over and over again, it gets insensitive. So then you need more. And this is a big driver of addiction. This is a big driver of compulsive use. Okay, so what is addiction? Well, it's funny. I mean, I've been studying it for all these years and I, I'll just tell you the truth. We don't actually know. It's kind of a word. Some people don't like the word. They think we should say um, we have a substance use disorder. We, uh, before substance use disorder, it was um, substance dependence. Kind of argue about it, but I think uh, whatever you call it, it has probably five attributes. And the first one is craving. So you have an obsession. You think about the drug a lot. Um, as I said, after that first a uh, good drink of alcohol, I, I really, you know, completely changed all my priorities. So it really became a big uh, kind of compulsion. And then there's tolerance. That's a tendency to increase the dose if you want to get the same effect. Or if you keep taking the same dose, you'll get less and less of an effect. Dependence, which is um, Withdrawal, basically. So when you're, you're dependent, when you take the drug away and you don't feel normal, you feel less than normal, you feel like something's lacking. Um, it has to have costs. So it has to be detrimental to the individual who's using and also to their context. And I think, um, so for me, I'm, I'm really the only mind-altering substance I use now is caffeine. I love caffeine. I'm completely uh, kind of obsessed with caffeine. So I have a special grinder and a special pot. And sometimes I go on vacations with those things. You know, I have a whole suitcase for my coffee paraphernalia. Um, but I d I'm not really addicted because it's not bad for you. Co caffeine is not bad for you. If, unless you're pregnant and trying to get pregnant, it's probably good for you, don't you think? So the last criteria is denial of a drug problem. I don't know if you can see at the very bottom. So you can decide if I'm a caffeine addict or just caffeine dependent. But um, this is what makes it so hard for people who are trying to work with uh, people who have problems because the, those of us who are addicted are the last ones to see it. So we're going to mostly focus on the top three of these, so craving, intolerance, dependence, and I'm going to describe why that happens. It's an inevitable consequence of the way the brain works. So, uh, but before I do that, I'm going to I'm kind of get a lot into my 40 or 36 minutes now, I guess. Um, I want to just summarize a whole semester's worth of psychopharmacology class in one slide. I'm going to give you the three bottom line things. Drugs, first of all, only increase or decrease what's already happening. They don't do anything new. They only speed up or slow down what's already going on. 
they all have side effects. There's no such thing as a drug without a side effect. That's because, um, like letters in an alphabet, the uh, neurotransmitters and the substrates for these drugs are used over and over again. So if you want to improve your mood and you take something that affects serotonin, you're also going to affect your sleep, your arousal, your sex life, your eating, because serotonin is not just involved in mood. Um, and the most interesting one, my favorite, is that drug effects are counteracted by an adaptive brain. So whatever you take a drug to do, your brain produces the opposite effect. I said I'm dependent on caffeine, and what that means is that when I wake up in the morning, I don't wake up in the morning. I, I, I open my eyes, I make my way to the coffee pot, I have one that goes really fast, it's a very quick coffee pot, and the dogs, the cats, my husband, my daughter, nobody talks to me until I get at least a cup of coffee in because I can't put a sentence together and I don't want to talk. So um, I, my brain is adapted so that when I wake up, I'm lethargic. Okay, so uh, that's my experience with it, but this principle of uh, kind of adaptation, which I'm going to focus, the, it's the, sort of the core of the book and which I'm going to talk to you about today, is an old idea and um, since we're at a wonderful liberal arts college, I thought I would mention it. This is uh, something that Socrates said right before he gave his final lesson. So he had been in a cell uh, with chains on. He got out. He knew he was going to be, he was sentenced to death for, you know, corrupting the youth and not endorsing the state gods. So he had to drink the hemlock soon. But as they took the chains off his arms or the shackles off his arms, he said he felt great, even though he knew he was going to die. And he, s he pointed out that, wow, I feel so great because I just was in pain. And if I have pain, I'm bound to have pleasure. And if I have pleasure, the implication goes, you're, I'm bound to have pain. So this idea uh, was picked up maybe in a more formal way by a French physiologist Claude Bernard, who um, was also an interesting guy, he, he married his wife for her dowry and he was kind of, he did a few uh, kind of questionable experiments, lots of good ones too, but anyway, he, he wanted, he took her dowry so he could fund his experiments, but he uh, was studying our physiology, so things like body temperature and glucose levels, sleep we were just talking about, and he recognized that um, these things, these sort of uh, core aspects of our physiology needed to be maintained pretty tightly. So like 98.6 is necessary for us. If we get too hot, we're going to sweat. If we get too cold, we're going to shiver just to maintain that 98.6. And he said this milieu interior is a condition for free and independent life, which I think is brilliant. Um, and again, he was mostly talking about body, you know, systems. Um, Eighty years later, an American physiologist, this one at Harvard, uh, Walter Cannon, took Bernard's ideas and used uh, the term homeostasis to describe that. Hopefully everybody's heard of homeostasis. It's my favorite word in all of language. It's so great. Um, anyway, he, uh, this guy also coined the term fight or flight. You probably have heard of that. So he was a brilliant scientist. And um, he was actually describing homeostasis in terms of the fight or flight response, which is the sympathetic, the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, and how that was counteracted by the parasympathetic nervous system, so that these two were kind of in balance. So um, getting back to drugs, they, all of those ideas, beginning with Socrates and Bernard and Cannon, are, um, were applied by two, I don't know if you can see it at the bottom, two researchers at the University of Pennsylvania in the 1970s. So this is a long time ago for most of you. Um, these guys took those ideas and applied them to feeling states. And so I'm going to have a few kind of hairy slides describing that. But what they noticed was that if you took a drug, and this red bar is supposed to show where the drug is on board, your feeling state goes from feeling neutral, so your neutral might be different than mine, but we all have a neutral and it's really stable. If, if something wonderful happens to you or something terrible happens to you, don't worry because it, it doesn't really change your 
your basic state. You think you would be happy, but it's only a little blip. So here the wonderful thing is a drug exposure, and you get a little rush, that's for sure, and then it kind of evens out, but you always have a dip. Just like the sympathetic and parasympathetic um, kind of work in concert. So if this is alcohol, let's say, you would um, maybe feel a little euphoric, and then you'd be relaxed and have fun, and then you'd maybe be a little hungover or wake up in the middle of the night. If it's whatever drug it is, it's the same sort of pattern. So this happens to you all the time. Maybe it seems like this is too arcane. Let's say, this probably hopefully doesn't happen to you, but let's say you discover a lump somewhere and um, you're worried that it may be um, cancer. While you don't know, before you can get the results of a biopsy, you're probably anxious and worried and not sleeping well and fretting. But if you find out it's benign, then you feel, you don't go right back to life as usual, you feel really grateful and happy. Life is wonderful, it's like a new lease on life. So kind of from one extreme to the other. Another example is um, while you're on vacation, things are great and wonderful, what happens when you come home from vacation? It's like, you know, what? Or the classic example I'm sure you can relate to, falling in love. So it's so great at the beginning, right? It's, it's actually, if you look at the, an MRI, you, an fMRI, you can't tell the difference between falling in love and cocaine, so effects. It's so great, you don't need sleep, you don't need to eat, you don't need anybody else in the world, it's just you and this sweetie pie. But then you get used to it, <laughs> and you kind of balance out, right? It's not that great. He's okay, or she's okay. Um, so everything goes along like that for a while until maybe uh, you get dumped or they die or something, and then you're bereft, <laughs> right? So you, it was exactly the same pattern as the drugs, wasn't it? It doesn't go to, um, from one extreme back to normal. It goes from one extreme to the other. And why is that? Oh, by the way, that should remind you a little bit of Socrates' um, shackles, does it? By taking these off, then you feel euphoric. It's kind of the same principle as midterms, I guess. Um, okay, so why does the brain do this? I'm gonna tell you, this is, a, this is a fundamental aspect of how the brain works. Why does it counteract change by producing the opposite effect? And in the book, I, I was so proud of this, I had about three chapters on this. I really got into it and I loved it. And my editor, who was not a scientist, said, are you kidding? No one wants to read this stuff. So I got it down to, you know, maybe 10 pages, but I'm going to get it down to one slide for you. So let's say this is the brain, uh, your brain having its normal brain activity. You're thinking about what I'm saying and how much dessert's left on the table or what you have to do tonight. And there's all this electrical chemical activity kind of having all this kind of uh, movement as you have these thoughts. And then let's say something really important happens. You have a great idea or you sit next to someone you're interested in. It's kind of hard to tell that uh, something important happened. Whereas if your brain activity is maintained really tightly and something then important happens, you can tell. It's really clear. Kind of like um, if you're going to look at the effect of dropping a stone in a, in a lake and if the lake is very turbulent, you're not going to be able to tell anything happened. So the brain maintains its homeostasis so that we can tell if something is happening. It's constantly tamping down. You say, oh, there's that, oh, there's that, and then you put it right back down. It's just the way it is. And this is, um, these pictures are from Solomon and Corbett's paper in 1974, which I really recommend you read. It's, it's long, but it's crystal clear gives lots of examples, but let me just tell you, because this is how um, most neuroscientists who study addiction think about addiction. So this, in terms of homeostasis, and in terms of Solomon and Corbett's 50-year-old model, it's still driving research today. So here's the, the, what you experience. This is how you feel. You go off of neutral when you get a drug, you have a little rush, and then it mellows out while the drug is still on board, and then you have this rebound. You remember that. The reason for that is because there are two things that are happening in the brain. The first is called the A process. They called it the A process. It's 
a direct result of what the drug does to the brain. So it could be THC binding to cannabinoid receptors, it could be nicotine binding to acetylcholine receptors, it could be cocaine blocking dopamine reuptake or something. It's what the drug does to the brain. That's the A process. And the B process to maintain homeostasis is what the brain does to what the drug does to the brain to counteract it. So it does the opposite. And we're going to go through at least, we're going to go through one example because that's what I have time for. So when you add what the drug does to the brain and what the brain does to what the drug does to the brain, together you get that. That's why the experience is that way. Now, you know that um, this is not so bad. This is sort of the ideal, a little hangover well worth it, for instance. But if you use a lot regularly, what happens is you get tolerant and you get dependent and you have big craving, and you experience something more like that. If anybody uh, knows an opiate addict, for instance, they don't get high. They just don't feel sick by using. So it's really a kind of a sad uh, way to be, I think. And the reason for this is obvious. The brain is a genius in a way. It's, it's probably best feature is its ability to adapt and to learn and to change. And so it and it, its goal is to maintain homeostasis. It comes on earlier, it's bigger, and it lasts longer to counteract it. So now you're really pretty homeostatic. And also, it learns to anticipate the drug. Just like when I wake up in the morning, I don't wake up because my brain knows this is the first thing she's going to do. Go drink some strong coffee and a lot of it. So therefore, I'm going to decrease, uh, you know, any, any hope of arousal naturally, really. Um, so let me give you an example of how it learns to anticipate. The paraphernalia that's associated with the drug, it predicts, this is classical conditioning for the psychologists in the room, these things predict using. They predict that somebody's going to experience the effects of the drug. So the brain knows that, so the B process is elicited. It could be the people you use with. You know, if you party with these particular people, seeing them will induce a B process. Um, it could be the time of day or the time of week um, or a particular end of campus. I had a nice campus tour today, so certain, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, okay, <laughs> maybe just walking in that area makes your mouth dry, I don't know. Um, it could be sports events or hanging out at the beach. For me, it was concerts. I love live music, and I couldn't go to concerts when I stopped using for a while because all I could think about was getting high. In fact, the, the first concert I went to, which taught me a big lesson, was Prince, who you probably know, at a small bar. It was great music, and I walked in. I don't know why. I must have been like a magnet, and somebody walked up to me probably three minutes later and said, hey, do you want to get high? And all I could do, I broke out in a sweat. I said, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't smoke anymore. I don't do that anymore. No, thanks, thanks. But no, no, no. The guy was like this. OK, it's OK. No. I, it's all right. No problem. But I couldn't enjoy the music because I, I was uh, craving. It could be feeling states. It might be that you know if you're sad or disappointed or even happy, and that's associated with having a drink or having something else, then those uh, feeling states um, elicit a craving. So whenever, it uh, could be money. This is a big problem for um, a lot of people, especially stimulant addicts, you know, they'll, they'll swear it off, it's terrible, um, you know, they wasted their money and they missed their kid's birthday or whatever, they're not gonna use, and then they get their first paycheck. And it isn't 20 minutes later. I, I mean, I don't mean to be light about it, but it's pretty much the rule rather than the exception that they're spending. Because all these things predict getting high, the brain elicits the B process. And what does that feel like? That feels like with uh, craving, right? Because here's your neutral state at the top. Now you're not neutral, you're less than neutral. You feel tense and anxious or you're suffering because the brain expects that the drug is coming. So this has all been pretty theoretical, and their, their paper's pretty theoretical. 
Oh, I, I guess I just wanted to say, in fact, uh, for those of you keeping track or thinking about this in real terms, there are really three main causes of relapse in people trying to get clean. Um, one of them is cues that I just showed you, which elicit a B process. Another is a taste of drug, and it doesn't matter what drug it is, because all the drugs activate that same mesolimbic dopamine pathway, anytime it's activated, it reminds the brain, oh, this is going to be fun, and then it makes the B process. I, I can remember, this is ridiculous, but I can remember one or two times thinking, I'm not going to um, smoke any weed till noon, you know, which shouldn't be too hard because I would get up at 11 or something. But I would then decide, oh, I'll have a beer for breakfast. And then as soon as I, you know, that was half down, I would think, well, I'd have one bong hit. Maybe it's okay. So this is really common. If you try to quit smoking cigarettes and you go to a bar and have a drink and you smoke and drank before, forget it. You know, start again. So um, the third thing is stress, and, and I don't know about the B process or not. My research is actually a lot focused on stress. This is uh, especially probably relevant for women, maybe more than men. But um, anyway, so I just told you that the brain adapts by creating this B process to maintain homeostasis. And recovery means that you have to readapt. You have to not use so that the B process will go away. And that happens. So it also takes some time and some support. Um, but I think the longer the person's been using and the more dose they've been giving themselves, the more regular that dosing is. So if it's every day as opposed to just once a week, um, then the longer it's going to take to go back. So that's sort of the general picture. But I thought we could talk about weed since it's California. And it was probably my favorite drug. It wasn't the one um, that brought me to the bottom so fast. This was in the 1980s, and I lived in South Florida, and I, um, it was stimulants, cocaine mostly. But, um, but I, you know, and I always wonder, what do people mean when they say your drug of choice? Because it, for most people like me, it depends what's there. But I think, um, I think I did really like smoking. So what, what is it with marijuana? Is it uh, like reefer madness would say? You know, does it make you crazy? Or is it, does it cause an amotivational syndrome? I don't know if those terms are still around, but when I was um, uh, using, this would be one of the big things that people who smoke a lot of pot are not likely to do much with their lives. Or is it medicinal? That's uh, maybe some promise. So what is the deal, I think? Um, so I'm trained in psychology, and I, I, I sat on the plane on the way here, and I thought I should probably take this slide out, but I just love this psychology stuff. So this is a, a study from 1984, 1974, also old, old, and these guys had no idea what THC was doing. So this is before we knew anything about cannabinoid receptors or how it worked in the brain, which I'll get to in a second, and they were doing studies in pigeons. And what they did was they had a pigeon um, pecking a key to get food. The pigeon was a little hungry, so it would peck the key to get food. And on average, it would be pecking about between 80, I don't know if you can see that up there, and 120, so around 100 pecks to get a little pellet of food. So they just peck away. They kind of like that. And then the first day, so that was their baseline, that session zero, they were learning to do that. The first day of the experiment, they give that pigeon 1.8 milligrams per kilogram. So it's a low dose of THC. A, a, high, a regular dose is about five, let's say. So they give it 1.8, and look, it totally stops pecking. So it's just sitting in the cage, doesn't peck at all, not hungry, just, I guess, thinking about it. Um, but on the <laughs> second day, on the second day, they give it the same dose, and it pecks half as much as normal. You see, 45 times. By the sixth day, it's back to normal. And when it gets back to normal, they double the dose. So they go to 3.6. And you can see it gets to normal there. There's a lot of days skipped here. But they just kept doubling the dose. Every time the pigeon would act normal, again, not wiped out, they would double the dose. And you can see that by the end, they're taking 180 milligrams per kilogram. So 100 times what they were taking before. Huge, and having no effect. 
So that's tolerance, right? That's called tolerance. So that's what they said, that, that pigeons get tolerant. So how do they get tolerant? What's going on? Um, well, so this, that was in 1974. This is in 1988, and I remember where it was. Um, am I out of time? Thank you. Oh, no, that's fine. I don't mind. I'm used to students, but I just don't want to <laughs> talk too long. Um, good. I'm nowhere near out of time, right? What time am I supposed to stop? No, oh, somebody stop me. Okay. I'm not going to go that long. So uh, I remember where I was in the world when this paper came out. People you maybe remember where you were when the Twin Towers went down. I guess not the students or when something else momentous happens. But this was such a momentous thing because I loved marijuana. And I was in graduate school. I wasn't smoking anymore, but I was really curious. How does it produce those effects? And this paper came out, and another one right after, showing how marijuana produced its effects. And they labeled the sites in the brain that marijuana was working. Um, and this is a, a sagittal section, so kind of a slice like this, of a rat brain who was humanely sacrificed after being given um, radioactive THC. And all the black spots, which is basically most of what you see, are where THC was acting. And this was a huge surprise. I can't tell you how surprised everybody was because um, there, we'd never seen this many spots, this many binding sites for any single compound. For instance, if you look at the places where dopamine acts in the brain, you don't get one one thousandth of this many. This was just crazy. It's everywhere, people said. It is everywhere. And in fact, um, they named these receptors cannabinoid receptors. And now we know this is the cannabinoid one receptor. There's two of them, but this is the important one. Um, cannabinoid receptors are the most prevalent receptor in the brain of this kind of type. They're all over the cortex, which is the whole outside of the brain. They're in the hippocampus, which is important for learning and memory. They're in the hypothalamus, which is important for motivation, eating, sex, sleeping. Um, they're in the nucleus accumbens, where pleasure is found. So basically, where they're not is where there's no connections between cells. It seems like cannabinoid receptors are in every single synapse, and the synapse is the gap between two nerve cells. In the in the entire brain, which was shocking. And so, of course, it said to a lot of people, wow, what the heck is this doing? We don't obviously have these receptors in case you smoke some marijuana plant. These receptors are produced at, at pretty big cost. They must be doing something. And what they were doing was responding to their own signals. THC is mimicking anandamide and 2-arachidonyl glycerol, or 2-AG, and these are the endocannabinoids, the, the, the cannabinoid transmitters that we make. Anandamide is a Sanskrit word for bliss. We need a better name probably for this. But these are really interesting neurotransmitters that I don't want to go into for too long. And the reason that THC works is because it mimics those compounds, which are acting possibly in every single synapse. So the marijuana plant has over 100 cannabinoids. THC is entirely responsible for the recreational benefits of marijuana. So it produces the high that I liked. Um, a recent paper came out about three weeks ago showing no medicinal benefits of THC. It was a huge study. It was, um, uh, let's see, began, I, I took notes on it and then I forgot it was just new, so I don't have my notes, but um, it's a meta-analysis beginning, I think, in the 1980s of, of many, many studies, thousands and thousands of patients looking at all kinds of promising things. And the conclusion in the Lancet Psychiatry is that there is no evidence for medical benefit from THC. In fact, there's significant risks. The two big ones that we know of right now are psychosis. We think that another uh, good paper recently came out last June where we, uh, the researchers suggested that about 40% of new cases of psychosis, which is the sort of uh, hallmark symptom of schizophrenia, 
are attributable to smoking high potency weed on a regular basis and also reduced cognitive function. That means um, you don't think as well. So not at all probably beneficial. Cannabidiol is another one though of the cannabinoids and that is beneficial. Cannabidiol definitely helps with people who are children usually who have a, a kind of untreatable epilepsy and maybe with other things. And I, I think it should be over the counter because, well, everything's over the counter here, I guess. But um, this is, is, if anything, it's a B process for THC. So the more cannabidiol you have, the less THC works. So it's not at all recreational. It doesn't produce any kind of high. It might be helpful for some things. It's definitely helpful for these childhood seizures. So to describe why this works, I thought you've been really patient with all my graphs. I'll talk about my dog for a second. This is Bowden. When he was a puppy, he was like probably 12 weeks old here. He was so cute. Now he's 115 pounds or something. But he was out walking in the yard one day, and my daughter dropped a piece of bacon in the grass. And uh, this is actually DNA. That's my bacon, but I can, you know, it's just as good to put up there. So he's walking around. He, th the bacon drops, and uh, you could almost see his brain. He went crazy because uh, probably this was such a meaningful stimulus. Think about it for a puppy. He didn't even know bacon existed. And he suddenly gets a whole piece, his olfactory bulb, uh, you know, where it smells, his taste receptors. So what likely happened is that in the places of his brain that are processing bacon, they're sending out these signals, these endocannabinoid signals, to kind of um, uh, strengthen the connections between those cells. Wow, something really big happened, bacon. So cannabinoids modulate all the brain activity because they act like a highlighter to um, enhance the connections, to sharpen the connections between cells when something uh, is worth noting. And that plays a big role in neuroplasticity, which is uh, how we learn and remember. We, we sort out what's important from what's not important, and, these, and you never know what you have to learn, what the bacon is going to be. Um, and so that's probably how they work. And so anandamide and 2 uh, arachidonyl glycerol in us, these endocannabinoids. I don't know what your bacon is, but maybe a great poem or a wonderful class or a job interview or something, but you're likely to have these um, compounds squirt out sort of selectively when something important happens that you're processing. And the reason they're all over the brain is because you never know what's going to be important. Does that make sense? But THC is different, isn't it? Because we don't have little squirts of it here and there. We take it and inhale it, and it goes all over the brain. And so everything is bacon, right? <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, the, the texture of the carpet. And uh, I remember one of the first couple times I got stoned, I, I came back to a friend's house, and we, had, uh, we were hungry. We made rice a -roni. And I could not believe how good that's. I couldn't believe it stayed on the shelves. It's like, why is this? I've never had this. It's so delicious. Like, I wouldn't eat that now for anything. But, you know, if, if the music is amazing, the skin is amazing, whatever it is, it's all great. So this is fun, right? Because it causes pleasure and relaxation. Those receptors are in the nucleus accumbens. It makes stimuli more rich and meaningful. That I really loved. So any drab day could be interesting, couldn't it? To me, it was an antidote for boredom, acedia. Um, but because of that, it impairs your memory. It slows your response time. It slows your response time because you're so busy looking at the texture of the carpet that you, you know, forget the other stuff. And so you have critical, your errors in critical tracking. But what's the big deal? That's not so bad considering how fun it is, right? Um, well, there is a B process, and for this drug, every drug has a B process. For this drug, it's really a simple one. The cannabinoid receptors downregulate. So here is uh, an animal, and it's, I know you can probably see it from the back just fine. So on this column, somebody, this uh, 
mouse or rat got, it was a rat actually, got, um, it's not my study, but got a placebo, saline injection. Here, the rat got one dose, a high dose of an analog of THC. And you can already see, with one dose, there's many less receptors. Here they got um, eight days of a low, medium, or high dose. And you can see, especially in the last column, how much fewer receptors there were. So this is true in animals, and it's true in humans, and it was definitely true in me. I, I, by the time I, so I chain smoked marijuana, it wasn't so potent as it is now, um, but I, I got to the point where I only really enjoyed anything if I was high. I didn't want to do family events, I didn't want to think about school or work or any kind of interests because nothing was that interesting actually um, unless I was high. So um, the same thing happens in humans. I don't, you might like this picture better. I don't like it because I don't, these big yellow blobs are sort of vague to me, but take my word for it. The receptors down regulate in humans. The longer people smoke, the fewer receptors they have. And like me, um, they do come back if you're abstinent. I was clean about four months and I was walking down the street one day in Minneapolis and I could not believe the color, it was October, of the leaves. So there were red and purple and orange and green and pink. I mean, it was unbelievable to me. And I hadn't seen, I don't remember seeing color for years before that. Um, now, I, I, I'm going to just skip, I have just one more like few sets of things to say, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. But one of the points I'm going to just try to make right now, and maybe is obvious to you, is that um, th the brain is always plastic. Plastic means it can change as a result of experience. But sometimes it's more plastic than others. It's really plastic when you're a kid, uh, before you're born, but then early in development, and then it really gets this big burst of plasticity in adolescence between puberty and about age 25. After that, it's, it's still a little bit plastic, but not so much. Um, so what happens in teens who are smoking marijuana is that the effects I just showed you are much stronger. Because the structures are being laid down, uh, the, the plasticity is um, you know, sort of organizational and maybe is more likely to have permanent effects. So these are areas, that's probably really foggy, where all of these areas is where the structure of the cortex is altered in people, teens, who smoke pretty regularly and pretty heavily. And the receptors are downregulated. So it's probably that this happens first. You downregulate those receptors changing the way the brain processes information, and that then alters the structure of the cortex. It also, um, oh, here's an example. So in rats, eight injections during adolescence, or in humans, about 10 years of use, beginning around age 15, these are well-documented studies, down-regulate the pleasure pathway probably forever. I think this probably is the case for me. I mean, I, I feel like I get plenty of pleasure now because I try to do lots of exciting things, but that drives my husband crazy. Because he'll say things like, can't you just be satisfied hanging around the house? Or, um, you know, do you always have to turn everything upside down and buy a plane ticket to some foreign place? Um, and I think partly I'm, I'm less content in a way. So, um, and this results in more in both the humans and the rats, when given a chance, more likelihood of taking other drugs and taking them more often. And I gave some papers here, I'd be glad to send anybody this slide set, but there's lots and lots of studies, so well-documented effects. And there are fewer of these receptors in mesolimbic structures and in other places. Um, they're also more impulsive, 60% less likely to graduate high school. This is heavy smoking teens and more likely to attempt suicide. Um, I think one, one of the most common things, after I wrote the book, and um, I get, maybe, I, anyway, s somehow something got on Instagram. I don't do Instagram, so I can't really say what it was, but I got 
a flood of um, notes, maybe hundreds, from young kids over about a three or four day period saying, you know what, you described exactly my experience, just like I had. I've been smoking for years and years and now all I do is kind of sit on the couch and feel um, lost. The, to make it even worse, very quickly, um, these, this B process seems to maybe be going across generations. So the offspring of adolescent rats who had eight injections of THC, and they had those injections when they were adolescents and weren't even thinking of having baby rats, or maybe they were thinking, but they didn't have any opportunity. Those rats grow up without any THC, mate, have offspring, and those offspring are more anxious, more likely to take more alcohol and opiates, and more depressed. And um, these offspring of those rats, so the grand babies of the first rats, show similar things. And this is epigenetics, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. I really recommend this paper, which summarizes a lot of the research. But it's pretty clear, I mean, sometimes I wonder, maybe it was the 70s that caused the epidemic of addiction we're experiencing today, because uh, there seems to be uh, long-term um, effects. So the brain compensates for any drug that alters its activity, especially when used during adolescence. And what it really does there is it decreases sensitivity to reward and pleasure. I try to say to my students and my kids, and I'm sure they just think I'm old, but you know, is there, is there something I could, I tried to bribe my own children with uh, plane tickets, because that works for me, um, to say if you could just put it off until you're 25 or so, you could uh, enjoy it more later, and you'd also enjoy other things more later probably, and uh, you can have a plane ticket. I don't think it worked, though. Um, marijuana is a gateway drug because every drug is a gateway drug because when you stimulate that mesolimbic pathway over and over again, it gets less sensitive, so then you have to take more of other drugs. And so I think that it's really important to look at the data and uh, before we just decide, you know, oh, this looks probably legal means innocuous, and if you need any convincing that legal does not mean innocuous, you just have to look at alcohol and tobacco. Okay, so I think that widespread use is likely to have lasting impacts for at least one generation, maybe more. So because I'm a teacher, I'm going to end with a quiz. Opiates, that what's the, why do people use those? They want to feel euphoric. They want to feel relaxed. They're, uh, they're dreamy producing. So you feel pain and discontent when you're withdrawing. So opiate addicts mostly experience this if they're not high. They don't really get high. Alcohol, I'm sure we have maybe more answers here, helps us relax, helps us sleep, helps us feel euphoric. So you have decreased pleasure anxiety, chronic, people who drink a lot are anxious, for sure, and they can't sleep. It's funny, a sedative produces those effects. Nicotine um, is, is kind of a complicated drug. It makes us um, focus and relax, so then you can't concentrate and you're anxious when you're trying to quit. It's miserable to quit. I quit. Ecstasy, you don't even have to know what it does, causes depression, for sure. And benzodiazepines like Xanax cause insomnia and anxiety because the brain is trying to maintain homeostasis. So the brain adapts to every drug that alters its activity to produce th by producing the opposite state, and that's what causes tolerance, dependence, and craving, and that is what uh, characterizes addiction. So that's it, I think. If you have questions and you don't get to ask them, you can write to me at Bucknell or at this email, um, but I hope to have some questions. So we'll now have some time for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and Lale or I will bring the mic to you. Um, please do try to keep your questions brief. Please stand up when you ask them. And as always, priority will go to students.
Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question is what the role of like obsessive compulsive disorder is in addiction, like if they're connected or if mm -hmm. you can say that like anyone with addiction has obsessive compulsive disorder? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't know exactly. Some people think that OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder is the big umbrella disorder and addictions are something under that umbrella. Um, what they share in common is the compulsive part. Um, so the obsession has probably got a different substrate. For the OCD obsession, it's probably a different part of the brain than the accumbens. But the compulsive part is always uh, these striatal circuits. I don't know if you've talked to this, but these habit, habitual circuits. And in OCD, you're relieving anxiety. And in drug addiction, it's more like um, uh, you know, a habit that you can't kind of break. So I think they're related, but we don't know exactly how. We do know that depression and anxiety, which is um, an, you know, a broad umbrella under which OCD goes, are um, genetically correlated with addiction. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on research looking at like using psilocybin for um, treating addiction to other substances mm -hmm. and whether you think that's a promising approach to, um, to addiction treatment. Yeah, um, I actually do. So uh, psychedelics, and I would call those LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, DMT, which is an ayahuasca, um, but not MDMA, which is ecstasy. So those four psychedelics are not addictive. They don't release dopamine, the nucleus accumbens. You can't use them habitually. Um, the fact that they've been Schedule One just reflects the fact that our scheduling, the FDA scheduling and DEA scheduling is uh, completely irrational. Um, I do think there might be some medicinal benefit. So there's, uh, I, rev I have a whole chapter on those in the book and I review some studies, but they're pretty compelling. So experiences with psychedelics are um, therapeutic, possibly helping people cope with things like anxiety, uh, trauma, aggression. Um, I don't think they're you know, something to be taken really lightly, but I think that they're a different category altogether, not addictive, don't have a B process. And they don't have a B process because they're so incredibly potent. They do have a B process, but it's very short acting. Um, and you can't really use them every day and get any effect at all. So three days in a row, there's nothing to it. So anyway, I, I talk about it a lot, but I think it's really interesting. Hi, thank you um, so much for your talk. I was wondering your opinions on naloxone. Mm -hmm. uh, naloxone is gr is great drug. It should be very cheap because it's an old drug. It's not. Um, so naloxone is for treating overdoses. Um, so uh, the way people die from too much opiates is that they can't get high anymore. And I and I have a whole other set of my talk about describing the B process for opiates, which is really interesting. And I'll just tell you the bottom line: your brain, our brains produce anti-opiates. We produce chemicals that block the opiates. So we don't downregulate the receptors so much, but we counteract them directly. And um, some, so people are trying to beat that, which they can't really do because your brain is producing these things really well. Um, and then they suffocate because it decreases respiratory respiration. Um, and naloxone will reverse that. So I think it's great to have around. I don't think it's a cure. I don't think it should be I think they charge a thousand dollars something for a pen, which is unbelievable because it was really cheap before they had this epidemic. It's an old drug. Um, now, naloxone is also combined with buprenorphine and suboxone, which you may have heard of. Um, and this is a uh, drug that I have strong feelings about. So, suboxone is a drug used in treatment, and what it does is it's kind of a not a very great opioid, so it, um, buprenorphine is an opioid and it will produce a high, but not quite as potent as something like heroin. And um, so people, you know, it, it staves off withdrawal, but it doesn't give you the same high. And then they put naloxone in it so that if you take more and more of it to get more high, the naloxone kicks in and it counteracts it. 
So it's a great crutch, short-term crutch. I think um, it's being used for months and years in people, and I think that's horrific because they don't want it. Nobody wants to go through withdrawal. It's miserable to quit this thing. You know, it's, your, it's what your life has been about. But um, staying on a drug like that means that the, in Pennsylvania, where I live, most of the funding for fighting the opioid epidemic is going straight to the drug companies, sorry, and not to counseling or, you know, rehab for vocational stuff or any kind of, a, you know, your dentist or anything. It's going to Suboxone. And also I saw some really recent data suggesting that bonding, so one of the things that our natural opioids do, our endorphins, is help us bond with our parents. And um, parents who are on Suboxone and children don't bond normally. So it's not a free lunch in a way. It should be used, I think, uh, briefly while people get the support they need to kind of titrate down. But nobody wants to do it that way. Yeah, That's a good question. Anything else? Hi. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering uh, if you like investigated, like if you're, um, if your parents had any mental health issues or uh, maybe you didn't get like the affection or attention you needed and if just generally uh, how important that is in like the early years uh, for like uh, occurrence of addiction later. So if you did I hear you right, if your parents just, have mental yeah. health issues, yeah. how likely are you to have them? Or like how um, early childhood um, nurturing, like yeah. how, how important that is, yeah. generally. I, I think there's probably nothing more important than the first two years, um, actually. So, but that's a different, uh, so I, I did talk about some of the environmental factors that can have an influence and nurturing plays a big role. I think I personally got pretty decent um, attention when I was a kid, so that wasn't it. But you asked a lot of questions. So one of the things is that depression and anxiety disorders in your parents or a drug addiction predicts any of the other three. So it doesn't almost matter. They're sort of interchangeable, like uh, you know, poker chips or something. If you have a parent who's anxious or depressed or alcoholic, you're more likely to be any of those things. Um, certainly the not being resilient to stress makes people want to use more to cope with stress, and that's a big factor. So re stress resilience is largely set in the first few years um, of life. And then trauma is something that the field, the clinical field, is really interested in. We recognize now that um, one of the best predictors, sort of aside of, from everything else, is uh, any kind of trauma, so uh, sexual abuse or neglect, or physical abuse can really increase the, the odds. So all those things make it uphill. But it's, it's really good to know, like in the US right now, um, a recent study in JAMA said that one out of eight adults has a, is alcoholic. And uh, more people are dying of opioids overdoses than anything else right now. So we have an epidemic not only, not only in the US, but all over the place. It's really, um, you know, you can almost think of the world as a place where a big group of people are trying to self-medicate as fast as they can and take as much as they can to escape their suffering, and the other people are just suffering. And probably those two things are not unrelated, but uh, I think I'm going off too long, but I think it's a good question. It's a big, hairy problem. I think you, that could be your dissertation, maybe. <laughs> okay, I'll go back up here so everybody can see. Hi, congratulations on your very long-term abstinence. That's really remarkable. Thanks. I was wondering what kind of personal strategies you have for, I mean, you undoubtedly encounter cues in your environment that trigger intense cravings. What do you do in those moments that you've found to be effective mm -hmm. in? I have a funny them? story about one of those moments. I was, I was trying to figure out, it was my last year of undergraduate, and I was volunteering in a research lab. I suggest everybody do some scholarship, but anyway. Um, and we were injecting rats, 
And when you inject a, a rat, uh, it's very unlikely, but you could get in a blood vessel, which is about as big as your hair. So when it, the protocol is usually to pick up the rat who's used to it, um, put the needle in, and then pull back, and then make sure you don't have any blood, which I never had for many, many, many injections, except this one day. I pulled back, and I forgot to say this, but so I, I guess I did imply it, but I, I injected cocaine and methamphetamine for a while. So I pull back, this is about three or four years later from any drug. I see the blood in the needle, the rat's blood, which it didn't register as rat's blood. I heard the sound of the bells in my ear that I would hear with coke. It hit the back of my tongue. I dropped the rat. I got all sweaty. Um, and I said to my lab partner, you know, I think I'm done for the day. And I went back and thought about that. But this was years later. It's like if you bring Pavlov's dog back to the lab and you ring the bell, even if they haven't seen that bell in a long time, they'll salivate. So that was kind of me. Um, but I think what I did is I, another big trigger and much less dramatic was is disappointment. So when I was using, I didn't deal with disappointment or sadness, I just got high. And so every time I get disappointed, I'd like, it's almost like a knee jerk thing. You know, I just reach for something. And so I had to find ways of dealing with disappointment that involved mostly getting support from other people. So getting support, getting time. And then if you, in psychology 101, you know about extinction. So the, the next, the second, the third, the fifth, the eighth time, each time the B process gets less and less strong because now I'm disappointed and it's been, I've had a lot of disappointments and I haven't picked up, as you said. So now my brain doesn't any longer think that disappointment predicts she's gonna run to the whatever. So I think time and support. And that's one thing that our treatment programs right now are, are short on. You know, it seems like we put them in detox for three days, give them a prescription and send them on their way. And I, don't, I think that's kind of the, not what they probably need. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm curious, uh, looking at any kind of psychiatric drug, uh, so thinking about antidepressants, anti-anxiety, uh, things like that, do those go through similar A and B processes, have you know, developed tolerance, yeah. that kind of thing? And Great. what then are the, con assuming yes, then what are the consequences of long-term use? Yeah, great question. Um, so for anxiolytic drugs, drugs that treat anxiety, they're mostly benzodiazepines and they cause anxiety. They have to just take, take them forever. And if you take the drug away, you can't sleep and you're anxious. And people, we have, you know, that has been such a money waker for so long since benzos were developed. You know, it, we give them away like candy. I think we sell more benzos than M&Ms probably in the US. Really popular. I'm not sure about that, but it's a lot. Now for antidepressants, actually the B process is the point. So if you take an antidepressant, you don't, they don't tell you you'll feel better in 20 minutes when it hits your synapse. You'll feel better in about three weeks. That's about how long it takes the B process to come on. And it's, they're not all that effective, but for them, the, that is the therapeutic part. But I, I think that any drug that acts to produce a change by affecting the brain is going to be counteracted. Now, if you take a drug to block pain, but it's, it's like aspirin or Tylenol, and it's doing it in the periphery, you don't counteract it. But if you take a drug like opiates to block pain, it's doing it in the brain, the brain adapts. So uh, yes, for every, for every drug. Hi. Hi. Sorry for my phone. That was really embarrassing. But um, oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, I was wondering for what people call like a natural high from like long distance running or other types of um, mm -hmm. just long term cardio, and you experience like yeah. post race euphoria and also like in race euphoria as well. I was wondering if there was a B process to that, or also if you completely stop and you have been doing it for a long time, if there's withdrawal symptoms. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, great question. So there's a kind of a lot of questions in there. So um, I take it you're a runner? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so running releases endorphins and other chemicals that make you feel good, and that's absolutely true. And if, we, if your roommate wanted to see if you had a B process, what he could do is uh, right when you get ready, you know, you're putting on your sneakers, you're planning, what, an early Sunday morning long run, you've been looking forward to it all week, Sunday morning, just stop you right there and just maybe interrupt you with some chores around the room or you need some help changing a tire or something else. You know, then you just get really tense and anxious, right? It, it's, it does go that way. And also, I mean, hopefully this won't happen, but if you get an injury, you'll have to cope with that too. So, um, yeah, we, we release endorphins during exercise. Now, one of the things about um, exercise or other natural forms of releasing it, so uh, taking risks or giving talks to new friends or those kind of things, those release opioids and they're here to help us cope and survive. So that's not, you know, we're not taking, we're not getting the kind of doses that you would be getting with heroin. So the adaptation isn't gonna be quite as strong. But you know you adapt. I, I, I can just, you know, somebody should do the experiment on you where they just interrupt you on your way out to begin. You know, and then you get a little bit anxious. You look like you're withdrawing, yeah. <laughs> you're agreeing with me, he is. He is looking like that's going to happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask what your interpretation of the role of like social support is, especially in um, the experience such as experiment such as like Rat Park, where they put a high like emphasis on the role of social social support in um, like lessening the impacts of addiction and the cravings for addiction and I just wanted to see if your research um, and your experience lines up with that view mm -hmm. or is it more complicated than that? Yeah, so um, you're asking about the rat park studies where they found that rats who were raised in really enriched social environments were not likely to take drugs uh, and would stop taking them. And in fact, Rats and mice and monkeys don't normally take drugs to make themselves dependent anyway. But if you have them in a single house cage, totally isolated from everybody else, you know, and there's nothing else to do, they will. I think in that way, it's a great um, example. But we don't have that kind of a life. So it's not, I, I think going from the enriched environment of rat compared to a really poor environment of rat and then trying to put that onto us is maybe not helpful. But the general principles are certainly the same, and that is that um, I, I think it's maybe not only important for treatment to have social support and options. One reason I think I was able to get well is because I, had, I went to a good treatment center and I had the ability to sort of go to school, not have a ton of debt, you know, I was, I was helped. Um, and I, th I could enrich my own life in a way with other things. So I think that's a big part of uh, recovery, having something to look forward to. And a lot of that involved people, and some of it didn't. But I also think more importantly, um, maybe in the prevention realm, recognizing what, you know, we've used drugs since the beginning of time, but we haven't used them alone until pretty recently. So that's sort of a new phenomenon where we sit in our apartment with the blinds down and use. That's all new. Um, and I think that having uh, connections, basically, are the antidote. Connections especially to other people, but to ourselves also, and to things outside of ourselves that are bigger than ourselves. So um, yeah, I think there's, there's no time, probably, where enriching our lives with uh, things like adventure or art or beauty or relationships is not good. So, and, and probably going back to the question about naloxone, it might be that that's a much cheaper and more effective way to intervene than to come up with some, you know, CRISPR modification where we can fix the bad switch as I once wanted to do. 
So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions Thanks. tonight. Um, just a heads up that her book will be for sale right there in the back. Um, if you're interested, definitely check it out. And now please join me in thanking Dr. Judy. Thanks. Thank you.